So I think we will kick off now. So first of all, uh, today's webinar, we're going to be talking about uh, consumer trends. Um, and surprise, surprise, it's going to be what is going on in the human consumer sector. And we're doing this specifically around uh, Q4 earnings, which uh, Walmart just released yesterday. And we're kind of about to start a very busy couple of uh, weeks. Um, I am very, very excited to uh, have participate with us, uh, Corey Tarlow, uh, who is a senior vice president at uh, Jefferies. Corey, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Ed, and thanks so much, everybody, for joining. Um, my name is Corey Tarlow. I am the discount and specialty retail analyst at Jefferies. So um, my coverage spans uh, really two two sectors, as I mentioned, discount and specialty. So in the discount or value sector, we'll have uh, the companies, like Ed mentioned, like Walmart, um, as well as Target and Mass and Club. We have Costco and BJ's and dollar stores, off-price retailers, convenience stores, um, discount grocery, and um, as in the specialty apparel arena, it's many of the mall-based uh, retailers that you guys are familiar with, like Abercrombie & Fitch, American Eagle, Gap, Urban Outfitters, uh, Foot Locker, et cetera. So um, I've been doing this now at Jefferies for um, about eight, eight or nine years, and um, happy to, to dive into what we're seeing so far in, in, in 2024 and, and what we saw this holiday. And I'll, I'll kick it back to you, Ed. Amazing. Well, very excited to uh, be uh, about what you're going to be talking about later today. Um, so I'll give you a bit of an introduction to myself. I am VP of Investor Intelligence at Placer. Uh, so I'm responsible for our business, uh, providing our geolocation foot traffic data uh, to the investor community. So that would be uh, sell sites like uh, Corey at Jefferies, but also hedge funds, private equities and VCs. So without further ado, uh, the uh, what we're going to be discussing today, brief overview about who we are at Placer um, and what we do. We'll keep that very short. Um, we're then going to dive straight into the, the consumer. Uh, we're going to talk about superstores, uh, the leading brands. And then please uh, share your questions with, uh, um, we'll have questions at the end. But if you do have any questions as we go through, please just do leave those questions uh, in the comments and uh, we'll try and answer that uh, as we go through. So just a bit about uh, background on Placer. Um, we collect uh, anonymized location data from tens of millions of devices uh, in the US. Um, we aggregate, aggregate this data. We normalize this data and create estimations using machine learning and uh, AI. And we're using this information to uh, kind of predict what is going on in the well, uh, physical state of the United States. We present this data, many different kind of signals and features, everything from who's going into stores, how many people are visiting a store or a location, uh, what time of day they're coming to the location as well, where these people live as well, understanding the trade area. And we could even see these things like uh, customer overlap between different chains um, and how stores may be cannibalizing one another. So vast array of data. If you haven't seen or used us before, please do reach out. Uh, but for those of you who are familiar with us, um, we'll be able to provide to you some very interesting insights. So the state of the consumer. So I think just starting off this, I think what I want to do is really kind of set the scene of what we're seeing, first of all, um, maybe on a bit of a more macro level um, and what's been happening in recent years. So I think one thing we've been really seeing with our data is big shifts in migration trends. Um, the Southeast, particularly Florida and uh, Texas have been really enjoying a lot of uh, increase in net migration. Um, and a lot of people have been moving away from the Northeast and California as well. Um, but Corey, first kind of question for you, like based on these trends, um, how are retailers kind of adapting their strategy to net migration to more the Southeast? And are some retailers kind of more ahead of the curve than others? Sure. Um, as I think about sort of the state of the consumer to begin with, um, just more generally, because it's quite topical given Walmart commented on it yesterday, um, what I'd say is that 
so far, what we saw in 2023 was a more resilient consumer than what we expected. Um, I think, and John David Rainey, the CFO of Walmart, even pointed this out um, in the Q&A section of yesterday's call, that uh, we had largely, uh, and the consensus was that we would be entering a recession in the beginning of 2023. And I think as the months went on, what we saw was a fairly resilient consumer and also a fairly resilient and, and strong job market. And that's continued so far into 2023, such that the consumer is still spending, um, but that consumer is becoming more value conscious. And so what, what that means is that this consumer is shifting more into value-oriented channels, so like mass, club, dollar, C-store, uh, off-price. And even within those channels, shifting more toward owned brands or private label products or exclusive brands to these retailers. So as we think about not only downshifting to specific retailers, but also downshifting within specific brands, consumers are looking for ways to essentially value hack their purchases. If they're making, I'm making this up, but a, a cake, they might buy um, a Walmart private label brand flour, but a branded chocolate chip uh, product that they're very, very uh, akin to. So I, I think that this is kind of the, the continued status of, of the consumer from a geographic standpoint, as, as Ed pointed out, and we think about growing markets. There are certain retailers that have recently pivoted to phases of growth. Uh, one, obviously, that we've already talked about and mentioned is Walmart. Um, they've, clo they've closed stores in the last 12 months. Now they're going to be reopening. For Sam's Club, it, it's now shifting to a phase of growth after years of stagnation and uh, even store closures. And many of those un unit openings, we don't yet know where they'll be, but um, certainly based on the way that other club retailers have opened stores, whether it's BJ's or Costco, uh, certainly the South or the Southeast could make sense, um, but we just don't know yet because they haven't uh, really committed to any uh, new openings at this time in terms of the location of those new openings. Uh, but we do know that they will be opening stores. Dollar stores that's continue a, to open. Go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, that's very, just to, to, to double click on that point, it's very interesting for the, the re retailers haven't adopted their strategy because I know in the restaurant space, a lot of restaurants are beginning to start opening up their venues in the Southeast. Uh, but it's interesting that retailers are kind of moving at that pace as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, so BJ's is, is one that certainly comes to mind as a retailer that's opening um, more along the, the east and, and in the south in areas like Florida, which you see is a bit of a darker color, right? And, and we're, we're very positive on BJ's. Um, so that's just one example of a retailer that's my, that's moving into these areas where you've seen um, more population growth. I see also, for example, Tennessee is, is a darker color on this map. What's based in Tennessee that's growing at a rate of 800 stores a year, that used to be 1,000 stores a year, but now it's 800, it's Dollar General. Um, so there's a lot of, I think, continued white space in the U.S. for store openings, specifically in some of these markets where you've seen a lot of population migration. Interesting. And, and you, you mentioned earlier that consumers are now uh, shopping for kind of uh, more value conscious goods. I mean, are we seeing that in, in uh, any categories in particular? Uh, the foot traffic data suggests like beauty and, as you mentioned, discount uh, stores that's been growing a lot but I just uh, it, in terms of kind of total spend like other particular categories that are more or less affected by that well certainly beauty has been a category that's been very resilient uh, based on conversations and data that we've seen and and, and and discussions that I've had with with many executives at, at various retailers whether it's Target and its partnership with Ulta um, or even the dollar stores and, and the growth that they've seen in their beauty and household products businesses. So um, clearly it's a category that's been very strong. It's a category that's been prioritized by the consumer. 
Um, there has been some willingness to trade down in the category away from brands. We haven't seen, I don't think we've seen that much of it, but uh, it, it's certainly been a very resilient category uh, as it relates to more sizable categories like food. We've definitely seen a really significant downshift into private label away from certain brands um, in categories like fresh. And I, I think if you look at it on a, a spectrum of categories like paper products and um, paper plates, plastic cups, things of that nature, things that are highly consumable in nature and also easily replaceable, uh, that's probably more of what we've seen in terms of private label substitution. But as you sort of go along this spectrum of willingness to trade down. I mentioned chocolate chips. Maybe you're loyal to a brand of chocolate chips, um, but you're not so loyal to a brand of flour. So within grocery, we're starting to see more and more willingness to trade down into certain categories. And I'll just give you another example. I was in a Walmart last weekend and I was looking at mac and cheese and I saw that the branded mac and cheese versus the private label mac and cheese was about a 50% price difference, which um, seemed to be a little bit higher and, and larger of a price gap than what I'd normally be used to. And so um, some consumers might opt for that store brand private label mac and cheese as opposed to the branded one. And so we're starting to see more and more of that. Interesting. So if you're a branded CPG brand, if you're a branded CPG company, uh, I imagine that's not a good place to be in right now. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but I, I think it just depends on the category. Um, there are certain categories that are duopolies, and then there are others that are not. So I think it, it really does depend on how commoditized the, the product is, what the brand differentiation is, uh, and, and among other factors, as well as uh, distribution and marketing budgets and, and gross profit dollars and, and all the things that these CPG brands need to take into consideration. So um, it, it, I, my answer is that it, it just, I think, depends. Got it. Um, I mean, that, that's uh, like, I, I think that's probably kind of a, a good segue just to understanding kind of uh, maybe looking at the members club uh, kind of retailers here. Uh, members clubs have been performing incredibly well. Um, I think you, you mentioned something uh, earlier, but you mentioned, talked about BJs, uh, but we've been seeing phenomenal growth. Um, from like Costco, I mean, their share price has just been going up and up and up over the past uh, few years. Um, what are they doing, which is so good? Like, how are they driving this loyalty? Well, I think it starts with membership. So Costco, and I, I just met with the CFO a few weeks ago in, in Seattle at the company's headquarters in, in Issaquah. And um, it really just, it all comes down to membership. This business is call it $240 billion in total sales. And they do, let's call it four or 5 billion in net income, uh, of which a substantial portion of that net income or operating profit that they generate uh, is membership fees. Because that those dollars, they don't have very many expenses tied to them, right? When you sell a product at Costco, you have to, as Costco, pay for that product. Um, it's a little bit different when it comes to these memberships, and then the memberships just flow directly to the bottom line. And so they're a top-line-based business, a top-line-driven company that's really fueled by the health of their member. And now they have the benefit of looking through the world with rose-colored glasses because their member is a little bit more affluent than the average household income in, in the U.S., and um, because of that, they maybe can spend a little bit more on not only on grocery, but also ge general merchandise uh, and, or their non-food segment or big ticket items, which recently um, have, have improved in, in the last month or so. So I, I think that it, it really comes down to membership and value. And Costco has, call it 3,000 items in its store. A Walmart has 100,000 plus items, but you can be pretty sure that the value that you're going to get at Costco for the product that you're going to purchase um, is the probably the best value that you're going to get. And so that 
value uh, that, that Costco is able to generate for its customer is, is really substantial, again, because they buy narrow uh, or they buy, excuse me, deep in a uh, finite number of SKUs. And that is able to really unlock the, the scale of, of the model across the 850 warehouses and 70 plus million members that they have, of which greater than 40% are premium matured members. Uh, do you think Costco is going to be able to kind of keep this moat going into 2024? Like it's got this kind of uh, very successful business model, uh, but do you reckon it's going to be able to maintain its kind of market share or do will kind of BJ's and Sam's Club be encroaching on that um, this year? It's a, it's a great question, Ed. I, I think that what we've seen so far um, is that, the club retail space generally has a substantial amount of white space and, and BJ's in their investor relations presentations and, and analyst presentations um, put out a, a market statistic that I think showed that club retail was only about 5% of overall retail sales. I don't see a reason based on the growth of these three players that we're looking at on our screen. I don't see a reason why that market share could not double or even more from there. Um, based on the way that Costco's mem and BJ's and Sam's memberships have trended, based on the way their units have trended. I mean, and then let's look at just from a unit perspective again, because we're, we're focusing on foot traffic, right? Costco's 800 unit, 850 units growing at 20 to 30 units a year. This year, it's going to be toward the higher end of that. Um, BJ's is growing 10 plus units a year. Uh, between 2015 and 2020, I think they had maybe opened about 10 or so units. Now they're opening 10 plus a year. And at Sam's Club, again, as I mentioned, 600 clubs in the U.S., they're now pivoting to a phase of growth too, opening 30 clubs over the next three to five years. So uh, the, the club industry is one that is really important to follow because there's a lot of money that investors can make. Uh, because of the recurring nature of the revenue and profit, as I mentioned, uh, and having this focus on stores to be able to track that growth is also critical as well. That's, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm very sad. I lost my Costco membership when I moved over to America a couple of years ago. So I definitely got major FOMO from that. Um, so you said you just met the CFO of, of uh, Costco. Was that the new CFO? Uh, no. I, it, it's the, I guess the the current CFO. Uh, I don't recall exactly when he's the transitions occurring, um, but it, it was uh, it was with Mr. Richard Galanti, which is he he's been the CFO of Costco for many many years. Okay, yeah, okay, got it. Um, so I, I guess kind of just like shifting to kind of target uh, at the moment. So. I want to go back into um, Walmart's um, uh, recent earnings. Um, they talked about deflation being a kind of a risk in uh, Q3. Then I think in the, the latest uh, earnings call, uh, the deflation was less severe than they anticipated as well. Like, what what, what do you think? Are, uh, do, you, do you foresee actually there being more deflationary trends this year? Uh, do you think that should be a risk going into 2024? So there's, I think, two key considerations to make as it relates to this discussion. Um, the first one is that the moderation that we've seen in pricing and that Walmart's expecting to see in pricing, it, it seems like it may not be as severe as expected. And then the second component is that in the wake of that, right, you need to have foot traffic to be able to offset any declines in pricing. So then who's gaining market share um, and how do we track that and, and monitor that and show that? So on the first point, John David Rainey, the CFO of Walmart, had pointed out on yesterday's earnings call that the um, inflation rate for the enterprise broadly, I believe, was about zero or maybe it was the u.s specifically it was one of the two but it's about 0 0.8 percent so up 80 bips and in their outlook for this year they're expecting inflation to be one percent so 
what I think this illustrates is that based on the conversations that Walmart is having with its vendors and with its customer insights experts and pricing experts, uh, the, the expectation is that pricing will be up. And so, well, what does that mean? Well, it means based on the conversations we were having three months ago, now I mean, we, we are seeing lower prices in things like dairy and fresh fish and certain meats. Uh, but maybe all of that pricing moderation is not likely to lead to significantly de a decelerated sales growth. And then that leads to the second part is if we were to see slowing sales, then who has the traffic and market share gains to potentially offset that deceleration in sales? Um, as you can see in the, in the data here, I, I think this is in an aggregate basis. Um, so Walmart's closed some stores. So I think that that might be impacting this data. But at least on a same store basis, um, you've seen traffic gains at Walmart. Here in this data, you're seeing traffic increases at Target as well on an aggregate basis. Um, but at least at, at a minimum, what I would say is if looking for and looking at retailers that are witnessing traffic gains is highly critical. And it, just in yesterday's data that Walmart published, I think they had posted enterprise comps of around 4%. Uh, most of that, if not all of that, was essentially driven by traffic. And, and so that is really the key component as you think about what's likely to drive market share gains uh, and continued growth for, for these companies ahead. Uh, and and um, we like, just want to take a question from the audience at the moment. So um, what's your take on Walmart's acquisition of uh, Vizio? Uh, most of the discussion has been around its retail media play. Uh, but do you think there are synergies between the two businesses, and what are they? Well, Walmart's a six hundred and fifty plus billion dollar business, um, and TVs is just one thing that it sells. So it, it 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 is like Walmart has had a history of making acquisitions, right? They've they purchased apparel brands, they've purchased uh, supply chain companies, um, and now they've made their latest acquisition of a, of a TV uh, manufacturer. And I, I think that the strategy behind this, and I should qualify that Walmart has not really said all too much um, yet. I mean, the acquisition was just announced yesterday, so it, it's still very, very early. Um, but my view and, and sort of what Walmart hasn't said, it, or maybe they could say eventually, but my view is that, uh, number one, they could help to lower the prices of their TVs that they offer. So this could obviously offer better value to their customers who are, as I mentioned at the onset of the call, becoming more value conscious. And this could be a critical component in an area where, again, it's a bigger ticket item. So where consumers are, again, stretched a little bit, are they all resilient, but a little bit stretched and looking for value, this could be a great way for Walmart to offer value um, to their customers. The second aspect of this um, really is, is more about data and advertising. And, and Ed, you pointed out the focus on retail media. And that's sort of the, the second component here and reason why I think it could make sense for Walmart. And we'll see how this data and how all the advertising or past potential paths to monetization play out. Uh, it's still very, very early in terms of, I, I think, the development of this aspect. We do know that Walmart processes over 40 petabytes on a regular basis just of consumer data. They purchase or they, they, they have billions of data points in their supply chain that they're constantly synthesizing. So this is another data asset that they can harness and then potentially turn into advertising revenue. It's, uh, it's, uh, absolutely, it's, it's nuts the amount of data that they have. I think their data team is like uh, hundreds of people. Um, yeah, hundred, uh, hundreds of people. Um, I, I think one of our, like when I joined here, I think one of the most, our int most interesting use cases, I know a lot of the advertising that Walmart is generating 
uh, comes from online. And, but uh, one of our use cases, now this is a kind of growing area in retail is indoor advertising uh, as well. So having kind of indoor digital signage um, and that's becoming kind of a big revenue driver for a lot of these retailers too. Um, just, uh, I, I think just taking your point that you mentioned earlier, just on, on the growth of Costco, I think one thing we've also been seeing, which is very, very interesting, uh, is just how Costco has been performing so well in virtually every state. Um, I know you said, uh, like a uh, Walmart target, they're kind of picking up, uh, growth maybe in certain reasons, but Costco, just even in the states, which are experiencing high net migration, like Texas and Florida, um, they've been performing one of the strongest in terms of kind of foot retail foot presence, uh, foot yeah. traffic presence. Yeah, and um, what I'd just but say I, there, I, I just, uh, yeah, go you, on, sorry. Just yeah. go back. What I would what I would just say on this is that because Costco is a top line driven company, it often requires volume had to have sufficient volumes to be able to sustain the profitability of these units. So um, when you see population migration into areas like Florida or Texas or Washington or as examples, um, that could often be conducive to incremental members to add to a club very simply, right? So having the member volume uh, really does help to help uh, make the club retail model work. So that, that is a, a big key as you think about the contingencies that are required um, on behalf of these club retailers to really make the models sustainable. Well, uh, interesting. And like, I, I think it's quite a last thing I want to talk about on retail members club. And there's a very interesting question. That I kind of want, want to ask after this one. Um, I just want to shift a bit to target um, target really difficult couple of years as well. Um, but um, are they due for a comeback? anytime soon? Well, I, I would certainly hope so. Um, I think that you have to follow a few key metrics like consumer sentiment. Um, and then they've certainly been building out their grocery business and they've seen really robust tra tra uh, traction in, in, in buy online and, and pick up in store. And they just uh, unveiled the new partnership. I believe it was with Starbucks for actually being able to purchase um, your Starbucks on your app and have it delivered straight to your car um, from the, the Target app. So having these sorts of things, I think, are, are really key to making a unique and, and special experience for the Target customer that, uh, in, as you see in the chart below, does earn a little bit of a, of a higher income than many other retailers, uh, that you, that, than a customer that you'd see at many other retailers. And so I think that that's key for, for Target. And as, as we, I talked about the job market being strong, as I talked about the consumer still being resilient but shifting to value, um, Target does certainly seem to check a lot of these boxes as you think about the, the health of the overall uh, U.S. consumer and, 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 and the retail industry. And so as consumer sentiment hopefully starts to turn, then you could start to see the discretionary aspect of the business get better, which, by the way, is also higher margin, too. So that does merit some consideration as well. Interesting. And I, I wanted one last question um, on this. So, and this was actually going relation to kind of Costco's and this from the audience. Um, Costco's BJ Sam's, any chance um, or will they start opening stores across each other? So a lot of the kind of QSR chains like McDonald's, Burger King, uh, they're all on top of each other when you see them. But do we see something like that for membership stores where we start seeing uh, locations open like a few hundred feet away from each other? Maybe. Um, there are certain markets that I've been to where you do see Costco and, and BJ's and or Costco and Sam's Club located within less than a mile of one another. So it's something that does exist. I've seen it firsthand in, in select markets. Could we see more of it? Maybe. Um, but it doesn't necessarily, given that one is present, it doesn't preclude the success of the other, is what I would say. And, and some of BJ's new openings in markets that might be near a Costco have still been very productive based upon the rent that they're seeing in that building, based upon the volumes that they're able to drive, whether or not they have a gas station. So there's a lot of different factors that I think merit consideration other than just proximity to another club retailer. And oftentimes, 
retailers can have or consumers can have more than one club membership. So I, I think that that also is important to to consider as well because sometimes you go to different club retailers for for different items. Are there do, do you are there is there any kind of number or data on uh kind of number of people who have kind of two, like two or more memberships? There certainly is. Um, and I'm sure that Costco, Sam's, and BJ's have done some analyses on this, um, but it is also not shared publicly. So I unfortunately do not know the uh, the answer to that question. Fair enough. I'm sure we probably have that data somewhere if we uh, start doing the analysis on it. Yeah, I'm sure you could certainly make some estimates based upon data that's out there when you look at sort of cross shopping tendencies, um, which could be an interesting exercise. Yeah. Interesting. Well, my challenge for this afternoon to find something around that. <laughs> sure. Um, cool. So I, I want to kind of move, moving away from kind of more, more kind of general retail. And I want to talk about uh, off price. Um, you talked about trading down, looking at off price retail, particularly things like apparel. Um, I was seeing a similar trend on that. People are becoming more value conscious. Definitely. Um, so I, what I think is key in, in off price is really just the fact that it, it's all a, very similar to the Walmart and, and Target trends that we've seen or dollar trends, it, it's all about value. And finding these unique, desirable brands at attractive price points um, really does help to drive traffic through the door uh, at these retailers. And so, for example, I, I was recently with TJ Maxx management a couple months ago um, at their headquarters. And one of the things that they had noted was that their comp is almost entirely traffic driven. And so it's really important to be able to follow these trends and, and monitor how how the frequency of, of the, the shop of, of these customers, because it can often have a pretty high correlation um, with comp sales. And there are really three main players in, in the off-price space in the U.S. That's TJ Maxx. They're the largest. It's about a $50 billion enterprise on its way to $60 billion. Uh, Raw Stores and, and Burlington, which is um, the smallest of the three. And what we've seen is, is fairly strong results um, across the board. And it, it's been, I think, by category, a, a little different. So apparel has been a little bit stronger home, at least for the last couple quarters, has started to come back after years of weakness because everybody bought stuff for their home at the onset of the pandemic. And we, we had to lap some of that uh, stay at home demand, COVID demand. And we're, we're just kind of now getting to a place where home demand is, is normalizing. So you're starting to see a little bit better momentum in, in the home categories at these retailers too. So that's another thing that is important to think about because uh, a lot of those home products were also coming from overseas and were were uh, were tagged with or or, or late or um, they they had really high freight costs associated with them. So now you're starting to lap higher freight costs as well, which could mean potentially better margins too. So if you have the traffic, if you have the categories, if you have the brands at the right value, and then you have potentially lower costs, it seems like that it could be a pretty attractive setup for uh, this group ahead. And uh, I, I guess like one of the things that like TJ Maxx has also been talking about as well is kind of to be targeting a more diversified demographic audience. Um, is this, is, is that, is that like kind of the winning strategy? Just like making sure they're getting as much reach, reach in the, uh, through the demographic mix. Yeah. So one of the things that you'll hear off price retailers talk about is having a, a good, better, and best assortment. And there's been a lot of availability from an inventory perspective across the board in each of those three categories, good, better, and best. And so as you think about good availability coupled with more store openings, right? These, these companies are opening stores at a rate of a couple percentage points a year, but for TJ Maxx, which already has a couple thousand stores, it's 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 very meaningful from a a volume uh, or square footage growth perfect perspective. They're opening a million plus square feet a year, um, so it's it's very meaningful. Uh, and, and opening these new locations, you can attract customers in 
lower income demographics. You can attract customers in higher income demographics. And they're certainly casting a much wider net. And we, we see that in the data. And what we have heard when we talk to management is that, that they're attracting a younger consumer, maybe a little bit more digitally savvy. And, and you're also seeing some potentially higher income consumers trade down into these retailers. And I think that all of that is really conducive to success for uh, these concepts generally. Interesting. So it's kind of almost a two-pronged strategy to kind of reach new audiences. One, through having a good mix of products, and the second, through their kind of retail footprint. Correct. Got it. And, and look, I, I think uh, just kind of, I think kind of maybe just tying on a bit more on this, I think maybe one of the things we've seen on this is that, that as you said, TJ Maxx, they, um, the average income of consumers has gone down. I imagine that's kind of indicative of their kind of their reach to kind of new audiences. And I think the other thing we've also seen as well in our data is uh, more young single families, which implies a kind of a young audience too. Yeah, like like I said, they've they've said that they they're definitely attracting some younger customers. You see that in in their marketing, whether it's on TV or digitally. Um, on, on your phone and uh, you can sort of get a sense for the customers that they're trying to attract and they're opening a lot of new stores and many new neighborhoods. And I think that all that is, is really attracting a, a broader audience. And so as you, as you do that, you're going to see a, a normalization toward, you know, the, the U S household income levels. Um, and, and that that's really, I think a reflection of, of what you see here in the data. And uh, I, I guess just kind of like now shifting on gears a little bit into discount and dollar retail. So to, we've been talking about kind of TJX or TJ Maxx rapidly increasing the number of stores or kind of these off-price retail. Um, and I know this has been happening a lot as well in the kind of the uh, dollar and discount store. But we're seeing a, quite a big divergence in some of these players as well. So uh, Dollar General, Dollar Tree growing, Family Dollar not doing so well. What's going on there? I, I think it's just a function of because your data also captures new unit openings in, in these numbers. So I think that it could be a little bit of that. Um, family dollar has, has done decently well, um, albeit off, I think, easier multi-year compares because um, so, so that it does merit some consideration. But overall, I, I think that there's been a trend over the last decade that's been more toward value and convenience and what has it more than a dollar store i mean other than walmart and then other retailers like that but um the dollar stores really do fit that bill because 90 plus percent of their locations are within probably only a handful of miles of of, of the most of the population so uh, they're really attractively located, and for a lot of fill-in type trips, uh, this business model makes a lot of sense, especially if it's in rural markets where the, these customers are underserved. I mean, it, just if you think about the demographics of the U.S., there are 20,000 towns, municipalities, and cities. 15,000 of those towns, municipalities, and cities in the U.S. have populations of less than 5,000 people. So these are towns with one stoplight, one pizza shop, and one general store. Maybe that pizza shop is, or maybe that general store is Dollar General, or maybe it's Family Dollar, or maybe it's Dollar Tree. But the reality is that there's these areas in the U.S. that are, are relatively underserved, and being a dollar store with the lean labor models that they have, with their low-cost operating models that they have, um, can present a unique way to actually provide uh, some good value for, for customers in, in some of these remote areas. And so as you've seen to Ed's earlier point about migration, um, as you've seen migration into areas like Texas where there's a lot of dollar stores or Florida as another example, um, a lot of that could be conducive to growth for the dollar stores.
Inter interesting. I, I know Timo has been a subject to discussion. I mean, do these guys see any threat for um, like rise, these kind of rising online players like Timo? But I imagine though that probably would be less impactful in rural locations. But like, do you have any thoughts on that? It's a great question. Um, my thought is that because dollar stores are more need focused and need based and need it now based. I, I tend to think that they are a little bit better insulated um, versus other retailers just because, for example, Dollar General is 80% consumables. I mean, things you, you eat or use and then you throw away. So I, I, I think that that degree of need-focused mix is relatively um, – insulating in a way that when you order something on Timu, it takes three to four weeks to get here and it's discretionary in nature. It's not need-based. And so I think that that um, value and convenience is a big differentiation between um, one thing that's just value and more discretionary in nature. Yeah. I mean, I guess you're not going to wait like four weeks for a new sponge or something like that. If you need it, you just got to go out and get it. Um, exactly. But uh, uh, like, I, I, I think kind of just also tying on to this, like we're seeing like obviously the the share, the discount and dollar store, store sector is beginning to start really start taking share um, in the kind of the off price grocery superstore um, industry. And I think just one other kind of thing that we're also seeing is cross shopping uh, has increased a lot. Um, is this being driven just by customers, more people are looking for a bargain? At the moment, like, what is your take on that? I think that that's a great point to make. So, I mean, more most recently, inflation hit a 40-year high, and prices cannot sustain that level of increase, and certainly the consumer cannot withstand that that level of increase unless he or she is 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 witnessing wage increases of a similar magnitude, and so. At, at at a certain point, right, you have to continue to look for ways to save money and stretch your dollars a little further. And, and that's sort of a trend that we're continuing to see, as I mentioned. And so with that comes the habitual uh, cross shopping that you're likely to see in, in an inflationary environment. So you'll see people go from Target to Walmart or Walmart to Target or Costco to BJ's and vice versa. And certainly in this data here, you point out people going from Dollar General to Dollar Tree and, and vice versa, or, or, or Ollie's to, to Five or our Ollie's to Dollar Tree and vice versa. So it, it, I think it's really just a function of the environment that we're in. Uh, and it, you have obviously some interesting data points below about where customers tend to cross shop. Well, I, I know we're kind of out of time, so I'm going to go just dive into kind of like, how do we summarize this as well? Um, coming, we're about to start going right into the kind of the uh, the weeds of uh, Q4 earnings. What do you think are the key trends you're expecting to see? Sure. Um, so let's, let's sort of put it in three different buckets. Um, the first would be from a sales perspective. Uh, what I would really be looking for is continued traffic growth. And we know that ticket growth is moderating. In some cases, it's even down. So the key is really on traffic that's driving sales. The second point on margin, it's really a function of better inventory. And inventories now, we've seen this at Walmart for three, three or so quarters in a row, um, where inventories have been down and gross margins have been up. And so when you have inventories that are in control, it tends to lead to better margins. And then lastly, on the outlooks, what I would say is that you're likely to see very conservative guidance from a lot of these retailers. Just to put that into perspective, Walmart had initially guided last 2023 earnings to be around $6. Well, they printed close to $7. Um, and now they're guiding on a pre-split basis around $7. And last quarter or last year, they beat and raise every quarter. And so as we look ahead and I think that this year we could they it could be setting up similarly. So I think that those are the, really the three key considerations across sales, margins and outlook that would be important to think about going forward.
Got it. And so from all the data that you're looking at and all the conversations you've been having with management, who's your big, who do you think is going to be the biggest beat this quarter and who's your biggest mess? Um, well, we did, using some, I believe it was Placer data, uh, predict about Thank a, a 4% promotion. comp <laughs> for Walmart um, in, uh, in the last quarter. And consensus was close to three. And so I think that having this, Data is definitely very helpful um, to us as we think about triangulating what that comp metric could be because there's really two components of it, right? There's traffic and then ticket. And so this is that, that traffic side of, of the basket. And um, it, it's definitely uh, helped to drive more accuracy in our, in our projections. And um, certainly Walmart was one that we had called out uh, to the upside. Got it. And uh, think that's great. And uh, in terms of biggest beat, uh, biggest miss. Um. Well, what I'd say is that we have seen a little bit of uh, slowing on a same store basis at 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 some retailers. Um, I, I think, and I'm, again, we're not calling for for necessarily a miss, um, but the data I think had shown a little bit of slowing at Target, if I recall correctly, on a sequential basis. Got it. Okay, that's uh, good to know. And I know we're a bit out of time, but I do want to kind of see if we have you got a moment to ask answer a couple of questions from the audience. Sure. Amazing. Well, thanks everyone for your patience on this one. Uh, so, question: um, Is Target trying to differentiate more from big box retailers? Uh, convenience being the differentiating factor. Um, and the second part of the question is: Are they able to capture the marginal customers from locations uh, being near each other? Um. So. The answer is yes. Um, they are trying to attract, uh, they are trying to differentiate. Um, I had mentioned sort of the, the Starbucks partnership and being able to buy that within the Target app. They obviously have about a third of the business being private label that is, is very, very different. And if you think about what they offer from a mixed standpoint versus Walmart or Costco, um, they definitely have a really curated, well-merchandised assortment versus other retailers. And so I think that having that unique product with a focus on value and customer service and experience really does make for a, a really con uh, attractive business model that's very conducive to success. And um, that that is, is one of the reasons why we, we really do like target as as a as a as a business and, and as a stock so um it, it's really about creating a unique experience and i i mean they've done well to gain market share in, in, across categories over the last several years um they've added i think 30 billion dollars in in sales over the last couple of years on a relatively fixed unit count so i think that that just speaks to not only the sales volumes, but also the pricing that they've been able to take and the incremental traffic that they've been able to drive, um, which is across categories. So, and, and I think it starts with creating a unique and pleasant and enjoyable customer experience. And they, they've done a really nice job of, of harnessing that value and showing that to the customer and then simultaneously driving strong results because of those factors. Great. And uh, one last question, uh, bouncing to back to dollar stores. Uh, in towns uh, which are over 5,000 residents plus, so not the tiny little remote towns, but the bigger ones, uh, do the stores ever directly locate themselves across from each other as well? Um, or does the first of the party foreclose for others from opening? Um, we've done some analysis on this. Uh, about, I think, less than 50% of Dollar General locations are located within a mile of a family dollar. So there's there's not that much overlap between Dollar General and Family Dollar. Um, obviously, across thousands of locations, there is some overlap. Um, but an, in aggregate, across the 20,000-plus Dollar General locations and uh, thousands of Family Dollar locations, there is a, a good amount of regional distance and disparity between where, where they're located. Uh, interestingly, I think 
if you look at their locations relative to Walmart, um, Dollar Tree tends to be a little closer to Walmart, whereas Dollar General tends to be, as a percentage of their overall base, a little bit less close. So I think about 80% of Dollar Tree locations are within a mile of a Walmart, and only about 50% or less of Dollar General locations are located within a mile of a Walmart. So it's it's they're more spread out, I think, than than you might think. Right. Well, Corey, uh, I just want to say thank you so much for your time today. Uh, it's been great, super interesting. Love doing this with you. Hopefully, we can do this again soon, maybe in Q two. Well, for Q1 earnings. Uh, but Corey, thank you very much.